hide eggs indoors, so <laughs> they're having lots of fun. But it's Palm Sunday, right? This is a special time of the year. Uh, there's a little boy who unfortunately was sick uh, on Palm Sunday, had to stay home with his mom, so his dad went to church. His dad came home with a palm leaf. I was like, what? what's up with the palm leaf? His dad explained to him, well, when Jesus came into the town, people were throwing down coats and, and palm branches in front of him. The little boy's like, oh, man, the one Sunday I missed, Jesus came to town? <laughs> what a passion. So this is Palm Sunday. There's a, there's a whole lot of uh, cultural significance, and, and when you look at the passage and you look at what's going on and, and uh, everything, we could, we could take this message in a number of different directions. Uh, but I've been really challenged with a few different things, so we're going to go in a certain way, but I want to set the, set the table for you. Let's talk about what Palm Sunday is, what it was, what was going on at that time. Now, this Sunday happened to be, it's just uh, the beginning, uh, leading in just a few days away from Passover. And Passover is kind of a big deal in the Jewish culture. It's a day of celebration. It's a time of celebration where they celebrate their uh, being released from captivity, God bringing them out of captivity into the, uh, into the wilderness, securing them, saving them, and ultimately into the promised land. So what's happening in this little city of Jerusalem is people are starting to gather. They're starting to come into town. You have all the regulars who live there. They're starting to build up. A, there's a little bit of excitement that's going on. And then you have visitors coming in from all over the place, family members, friends. Everyone's just coming into this little town to celebrate uh, the Passover. So if you can envision, this, the, there's people all over the place this day when Jesus rides into town. They're, they got bags of stuff and goods. They're walking through with their own pack animals. There, there is not a lot of space to move around. And the whole city is just full. And now I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Israel this past year, and I saw Jerusalem and saw what the size was. It's not that big. Like, you think it's huge, big, giant city. It's not that big. And we're talking about over 100,000 people just crammed into these streetways, these walkways, and these corners. And this is what's going on in the city. There's an excitement building. Uh, you know, they're basically getting ready for a nice big party of celebration. So there's this atmosphere is what Jesus is getting himself uh, into, what he's getting ready to go into. Now, Jesus himself is not staying in town. He's staying out of town. So he sets up in such a way where he's, he sends his disciples in, and we saw through the reading He's going to go into town, and he said, grab me a donkey. But not just any donkey. You're going to grab the foal of a donkey that's tied up, and just grab it and go. And if they say, hey, what's going on? That's my donkey. Say, it's okay. Jesus will give it back to you. So he sends them in to get the donkey. And this is all to follow through on the prophecy that we find in Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So to these people, and the Israelites and the Jews, they are very in touch with the Old Testament scriptures. They know what's going on. They're, they're very familiar with this. It's a culture that's tied into this. So the donkey has connotations that the people would understand. In fact, in 1 Kings 133, when King David is, is setting his son Solomon up, uh, is Solomon's being anointed as his successor, it says, The king said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. So here we have a connection with Solomon, with David, with the king. So the crowd, when they see this individual riding into town on a donkey, they already have a connotation. They already have a backdrop of what's happening. Now, historically, in these times, and a king during a time of war would ride into town on the back of a horse. And not just any horse, but the biggest, strongest, most beautiful horse. In a time of war, the king would basically parade himself in in a show of power. But if it's a time of peace, or they just finished the war, and they're in a time of peace, the king would come riding in on a donkey. Therefore, and it's being further reinforced in Zechariah 9.10, where we see, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle now shall be cut off, and he shall speak 
peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, from river to river to the ends of the earth. So the Jewish people are aware that riding the donkey means peace. They are aware that riding the donkey means he's bringing in a kingdom of peace. Now, there is a little miracle happening here that we can't overlook. What kind of donkey is he riding? He's riding an unbroken, in essence, a wild donkey. This donkey has never been ridden before. Now, I've seen enough Westerns in my time. I know what happens when a person gets on a horse that has never been ridden before. What happens to that person? They're back on the floor, right? Eight seconds later, something like that. This is not an easy task. This is a miracle in and of itself, that he's riding a donkey that's never been ridden before, and he's just riding it. Not only that, he's going into town. People are throwing coats down in front of this donkey's face. They're waving palm branches in front of this donkey's face, and Jesus is still riding peacefully into the city. Let's not overlook this miracle and God's control over nature. Now, if I got on a little donkey, poor, poor little donkey, I don't think he'd kick me off for the simple fact he couldn't. But I doubt Jesus was my size. So he demonstrated some of his godness in this moment, and we can't overlook that. So we're coming into the city. There's chaos. There's, there's things going on. There's, uh, there's shops are open. Of course, you know, everyone's coming into town, so the shops are open. People are going, and they're buying their lamb for Passover. Uh, they have to purchase their lamb and live with this lamb for four or five days. Uh, it's a very weird tradition. But, so there's animals all over the place. There's people all over the place. It's just crowded chaos. Think Broad Street during the Super Bowl parade. It's just nuts out there. And then... Some people start recognizing this Jesus guy. And what happened previous weeks and months is Jesus is slowly working his way towards Jerusalem, performing miracle after miracle after miracle. In fact, one of the most recent miracles before this, Jesus raised a little guy named Lazarus back from the dead. And if you read in Luke, the book says, in the front of the crowds he called Lazarus. Now, little known fact, if you see someone get up and walk out of their grave, You're not going to keep that a secret. You're going to tell somebody. So word is getting out that Jesus raised up Lazarus from the dead. And this kind of stuff is going around. And then you start asking, well, what else did Jesus do? Well, he's healing this person. That person can see. This person can walk. Word is getting out about Jesus, and it's spreading through. Now, he's on the back of a donkey, walking into town, a king of peace. Now you can start to see the word is starting to get out. The murmur. Now we're starting to create this impromptu parade is going on. And they start throwing down their coats, and they start throwing down the branches, similar to in 2 Kings, verse 9, when when Jehu was announced king. So then in haste, every man of of them took his garment, put it under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed Jehu's king. In essence, they're laying out the red carpet for this guy. So word's getting out, and off in the distance, you can imagine these crowds, and, and he's entering in the city in one way, and, and, the, and the murmurs are starting to come through, and then, and then someone starts shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! And they're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then off in the distance, they start to hear these chants, and they're like, what's going on? What's going on? And they're saying, Hosanna! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. This, God, this king riding in on the donkey, this great king is coming in. Now, Hosanna means please save or, or save us now. They want a savior. They want this king to come in and overthrow Rome, who has been oppressing them for so long. This word is starting to spread through the city. In fact, I can imagine the conversation down the road. They start hearing the commotion. The guy's like, who is that? Oh, it's, it's Jesus. Wait, Jesus, the Lazarus Jesus? That Jesus, the one who's healing everybody? Yeah, that one. Well, what's he doing? He's riding a donkey. A donkey? Wait, are you for real? Yeah, I'm for real. Wow, finally someone's going to come and overthrow Rome. Our Savior is here. Hosanna in the highest. And you can feel this momentum, this building up. All these people starting to gather around, creating this carpet of coats and palm branches as this king is coming to overthrow Rome. But then, a few days later, this king that they were celebrating didn't overthrow Rome. He's not who they thought. He was going to be. He came as a savior, but not the savior that they wanted. 
I thought he was going to be king. I thought so too. Well, what are we supposed to do? I don't know. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas. The same voices crying out Hosanna are now crying out crucify him because he didn't do what they wanted. Their expectations and their, what they wanted from Jesus was not what he was offering. And this is where they're getting, clues, getting lost. They wanted a prince of war, not a prince of peace. They didn't want to, to stay under the authority of Rome, but they also didn't want to stay under the authority of God's son. And we still have that problem today. We want a savior who won't allow anyone to go to hell, but yet we still want a savior who is just and fair. We don't mind crowning Jesus as Lord of our, of our lives so long as we don't have to submit to him on a daily basis. We want a savior who will take us to heaven, but we don't want a savior we're, 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 that we have to live for while we're here. Jesus wasn't what they expected or wanted. Too often, this is a, a quote that I, uh, I found recently, it's been just stuck in my head, and I did extensive, extensive Google search uh, to try to find out who said it. So I have no idea who said it, Google doesn't know, so no one knows. But the quote goes, too often we are caught worshiping our preferences instead of our God. We have this image and this thing that we want, but it's not really who God is. When we move God from his throne, we expect Jesus to do something different than what he is offering. Worshiping our God means serving our God. It means getting uncomfortable. Sometimes we have to do things that we don't want to do. Sometimes it means doing things when prompted. And sometimes, like in the case of the next story, it means waiting on God's timing. Abram and Sarah, Sarai, Abraham and Sarah, depending on when you meet them, depends on what their name is, they're a perfect example of someone who wasn't willing to wait on God's timing. Now, God made a covenant with Abram. He's one of the great men of faith in the Bible. God said, go, and he went. He didn't ask for details. He just went. We see in Genesis 12, 1, it said, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And if you know the story of Abraham, you know that he is essentially going to become the father of a great nation. If you went to Sunday school when you were a kid, you know that song, Father Abraham had many sons, right? And that's the whole idea. And Abraham knew of this promise from God, and he clung to this promise from God because, quite frankly, he uprooted everything, and he only had God to rely on. A few years pass by, and it dawns on Abraham, wait a second, I don't have a son. Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, and your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Basically, a, a servant who just kind of grew up at, like a family member. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as his righteousness. How many of you guys have ever like, looked outside in the stars? It's nighttime, you look up. Now, if you do it here in South Jersey and you look up, you're going to see dozens of stars. If you get out to the Midwest, somewhere in the open plains where there is no light, get up in the mountains and you look up into the stars, I mean, it looks like a little kid's art project, just glitter all over the place. It is impossible to count the stars. And this is a reference that Abraham knew. So now he's saying, okay, God, He's getting old, he's getting, his wife's getting old. Like, they're, they're past the normal child point. But he says to himself, I trust in you. This is the way it's going to be. But then time happens. 
and Sarah's getting, Sarah's in her mid-80s, Abraham's in it, or Sarah's in her 70s, Abraham's in his 80s, uh, not ideal child-bearing uh, age. And we start to see Sarah get a little bit impatient on God. So she devises a way to jumpstart God's plan. So maybe she thought to herself, maybe God needs a little help. Uh, maybe he forgot how old I am. So we'll take matters into our own hands. Genesis 16 says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Now, culturally, this is common. It's weird nowadays. We would never do that. But culturally, at that time, if the wife couldn't bear children, she would then take a trusted servant who would then bear the children and carry on the name. She would kind of adopt that child as her own. And this is the process. So this wasn't culturally uncommon. What it was was not according to God's plan. Now, obviously, Abram served did not wait on God. The result of this uh, union was a son named Ishmael. So Ishmael is born. He's Abraham's son, Hagar's son. And almost immediately, Sarah regrets the decision. And she has a little bit of disdain towards Hagar and towards Ishmael. In fact, it is another 13 years later before the angels of the Lord visit and before Sarah has Isaac. Same Isaac that God asked Abraham to sacrifice later on. So we have a 13-year gap between Ishmael and Isaac. And what happens is there starts to be a little bit of a conflict between the two. Genesis 21 says, And the child grew, talking about Isaac, grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. Basically, what the, what the theologians say is Ishmael was teasing Isaac. 13-year-old boy, 12, 13-year-old boy teasing Isaac. And this brought out Mama Bear. So in verse 10, she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to, said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and skin of water, and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And if you continue to read the story of Hagar and Ishmael, uh, God continues to take care of and supply them and, and really does take care of the family. But what we want to do is look at this through real eyes. This is a 13, 14-year-old boy getting kicked out of his house. He is uh, historically Christian's Jewish culture does not recognize Ishmael as Abraham's firstborn. Not, he is not the one to receive the inheritance. But there is a religion who does recognize Ishmael as the firstborn, and that happens to be Islam. Now, let's look at what happened to Ishmael. He had a dad. He had a mom. He had a family. He had a life. He had a good life. He had an inheritance coming his way. And then one day, all of that is just taken away from him. If you look at Abraham, Abraham was told by God, you're going to have a son, you're going to have a family, you're going to have a, a great inheritance, many. So think of the anticipation that Abraham had to have a son, to wait for that. Think of the relationship between a father and son when a father's been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting to have this son. Think of how close Abraham and Ishmael probably were. Go back into the middle of the passage. It upset Abraham for his son that Sarah was so upset at Ishmael. This is a close relationship that was severed, just torn away. This is 
a boy who's cast away, it no longer has inheritance. And one day he's sleeping in his father's tent. The next day he loses his dad. He loses his inheritance. He's out in the desert. He's out on his own. And that brokenness, that woundedness, that rejection that was placed in that child is what has been passed on down in the religion of Islam. I did a little bit of research and found what I think is one of the better descriptions of, uh, from Joel Richardson. Uh, wrote uh, the book, The Biblical definition of Islam. And he says, Muhammad, the founder of Islam, claims to be a direct descendant of Ishmael and Muslims today, oh sorry, and Muslims today view themselves as both the physical and spiritual descendants of Ishmael. And so here you have this story, this incredible event that took place in this child's life. 2,600 years later, after these events take place, a direct descendant of Ishmael named Muhammad birth forth a new religion into the world. And what does a religion teach? It teaches God is not a father. It teaches God has no son. And thirdly, that Ishmael, not Isaac, is the heir with regard to the promises of God to the earth. And the very things that those issues of rejection and woundedness and brokenness that took place in Ishmael's life are preserved in that line 2,000 years later when a man named Muhammad goes into a cave has an incredibly dark encounter with some sort of spirit, and then comes out as the origin of Islam. So in a spiritual sense, Islam is the broken, bitter cry of Ishmael. Abraham's inability to wait on God's timing resulted in a religion that is diabolically opposed to the Christian faith and values, and we are still fighting against that today. Now, I encourage you to wait on God. Your impatience and jumping the gun may not result in a competing nation, may not result in a competing religion, but it can hurt you, it can hurt your family. And quite frankly, it's going to be a giant hindrance to your walk. We move God from his throne when we try to execute God's plan without God's involvement. The next story, the Israelites. The Israelites themselves were like grand champions of falling in and out of favor with God. And one of the greatest examples comes early in their history. God promised to them that they would live in a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3.8 says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Havites, and the Jebusites, and other ites, and ites, and ites, and ites. So the Israelites finally get to the land. And we have to do a little bit of backstory on this. Where were they previously? They were slaves in Egypt. And then God brought about these plagues to help move the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh finally said, all right, get out of here. God protects the Israelites through all of that stuff going on, all the death, destruction, the nastiness that the plagues brought. The Israelites are protected from that. They finally get out, and they're they're running away, and they get to this sea. They can't cross it. They turn around, and they look, and they can see the clouds of the Egyptian army coming to take them back. Now they're freaking out. They don't know what's going on. Then Moses, God calls Moses. Moses steps forward, and what happens to the sea? It parts. Dry land. And they walk maybe fast walked, through the water, through, on dry land. This is one of the things I want to do in life. I want, who doesn't want that? Remember this little kid, see pictures of the fish swimming around? I mean, I just want to put my hands in the water, walk on through. This is one of the experiences I'm going to have when I go to heaven. I want to replay this thing and just kind of mess around with a wall of water. So then they get across. That's an incredible miracle. This is amazing. God brought us through, and they turn around like, oh, the army's coming through the exact same path that we came through. What's going on here? Oh, wait, the sea is swallowing the army up. And now they're walking through the wilderness, they're walking to the promised land, and God's taking care of them through that walk too. And they finally get there, they get to the promised land, and because of some of the murmurs and stuff, God says, all right, Moses, go ahead and send in some spies. Let them check out the land. Let them tell the people what's going on. So he chooses 12 12 spies, one from each tribe. 
And they go into the land and they're looking for, they want to check out the strength of the people. They want to check out the strength of the city. How many people are there? What's the quality of the land that's in there? And then at the end, Moses says, look, bring back some of the fruits of the land. So they spend 40 days going all throughout the land and they come back with their report to Moses and the people. Numbers 13 says, at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation, and they showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit, giant fruit. They're saying it is everything God said it was going to be milk and honey all over and the, the grapes are like a whole meal you just have like one grape and you're full like this is an incredible place but numbers 13 however the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large and besides we saw descendants of Anak there they saw giants, eight, nine-foot-tall men walking around. And the Melekites dwell in the land of Negev, and the Hittites, and the Chebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. Ten of the twelve spies said, it ain't worth it. We're not going. It's not worth it. So the people reacted. Numbers 14, then all the congregation, and it says all, raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we have died in the land of Egypt, or would that we have died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall prey by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And then they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Despite the petitioning of Moses, Aaron, Caleb, and Joshua, the people grumbled and complained. And quite frankly, they were in utter disbelief that the same God that rescued them from the Egyptians could set them up in the promised land. They just didn't believe. So God had enough. So truly as I live, as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice. None of them shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. So for every day the spies were in the promised land, that's a year that the people wandered the desert. And not a single person that grumbled and complained got into the promised land. They just died over those 40 years. They never got to see it. And I will never understand, because it's not like ancient history. It's not generational history. It was their history. They walked through the waters. They saw God bring them out of Egypt. They saw the incredible physical power of God, and yet that still wasn't enough to go into the promised land. So we remove, we move God from his throne when we refuse to remember and trust in what he has done in our lives. Just look back on your own life. We've all had dark times, difficult times, and yet we've come through, and who brought us through it? It's God. We all have a story like that. And yet when we come up to the next difficulty, when we come up to the next wall, when we come up to the next sea, we say, God, you can't possibly get me out of this one. And we fall back into our own traps and we end up wandering the wilderness of our own faith. And we miss out on this great blessing that God has. The Israelites wanted the promised land, but they couldn't bring themselves to trust in God's plan. Abraham wanted his promised nation, but got impatient and tried to fix things on his own. And then the people, they wanted a conquering king coming into their city, but when they didn't get it, they crucified him. 
have we made the way for the king in our own lives? A boy goes to his father and says, Dad, if there's three frogs on a branch and one decides to jump, how many frogs are left? The dad goes, two. No. If there's three frogs on a branch and one decides to jump, how many are left? Dad's getting a little smart. He was like, all right, well, if one jumps, they're all jump. No frogs are left. The son goes, no. He said, Dad, one frog decided to jump, but never jumped. How many of us decide to do things, decide to put God on the throne, but never actually take the physical steps to do that? We need to put God first. Not just decide to put God first, but to actually put God first. How do we know if God is on the throne of our lives? It's not where you spend your most time, because quite frankly, you spend most of our time working and sleeping, right? I love sleep. I need more of it. I've got to find a way to get that. And it's definitely not where you put your most money, because most of us put our money back into our houses, right? That's where most of, our, that's where most of my check goes. How do we determine if God is on the throne in our lives? The first thing is God is the thing that you love most. Secondly, God is the thing that you serve gladly, gladly serve. And third, God is the thing that is non-negotiable. When all else fails, when everything is pushed aside, God is the one thing that you need to have and you cling on to. Everything else goes, but God stays. I want to wrap up with a little uh, love story. A young man who's just madly in love with a girl. Some of you guys can know where we're at. I mean, I think it's probably back in the college days when you first are, maybe not 10 years into your marriage, who knows. Think of young love. He is passionately in love with this girl, so he decides to write her a letter. Not an email, not a text, an actual handwritten letter. So he writes her, a letter said, my darling, to be with you, I would be willing to endure the harshest cold of the Arctic. My darling, to be with you, I would crawl through the burning sands of the desert. My darling, to be with you, I would swim across shark-infested oceans. Darling, just to be in your presence, I would endure all this. And I will see you on Wednesday, unless it's raining. <laughs> How many of us have that passion for God? God, I will do anything for you, just not on Sunday. God, use me how you want to use me, just make sure I'm okay with it. God, not your will, but mine. We don't mind crowning Jesus as Lord of our lives as long as we don't have to submit to his rule and authority. We need, in our own lives, to make way for the king. Put him back on his throne. And allow the Savior to be the Savior that he came to be, the Savior of our lives, taking on the sin. It's a wonderful time of the year. Taking on the sins of the world. But don't get lost in the sins of the world. He took on your sins and your sins. But we can't miss out on that point. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for your willing, loving sacrifice. Lord, I know there's people in this room who don't understand your love, who don't understand what Jesus has done for them. God, give them the courage to ask. Maybe today they meet Jesus. Maybe today they understand. Father God, I thank you for this church, for the passion to serve you. I pray that we are constantly, every day, putting you on the throne. We're making way for you, our coming, Hosanna, saving King. It's your great holy name, we pray. Amen. Happy Palm Sunday. We'll see you guys next week.